Hi, this is Eric Cohn, executive producer and host of Act in Line. And before this week's episode, I want to briefly tell you about our upcoming Poverty Cure Summit, an Acton Institute event. The Poverty Cure Summit is a premier digital experience. You'll have the opportunity to hear scholars, human service providers, and practitioners address the most critical issues we face today, which can either exacerbate or alleviate poverty. With conversations rooted in foundational principles of anthropology, politics, natural law, and economics, you'll gain a deeper understanding of the root causes of poverty and identify practical means to reducing it and promoting human flourishing. Featured speakers include Amity Schles, Anthony Bradley, Philip Booth, Isis Brantley, Peter Greer, Mauricio Miller, Anne Rathbone Bradley, Jay Richards, and many more. The Poverty Cure Summit will take place November 18th and 19th, virtually, so you can join from the comfort of your living room. Registration for the Poverty Cure Summit is $99, but if you visit PovertyCureSummit.org right now and enter the discount code ACTINLINE, all one word, at checkout, you can register now for only $49. Just enter the discount code ACTINLINE, all one word, at checkout. Your Poverty Cure Summit registration includes access to main stage sessions, a diverse range of panel discussions with experts and practitioners, interactive question and answer sessions with our panelists, and networking opportunities with summit attendees. Join the conversation and be a part of the cure. To register or learn more, visit PovertyCureSummit.org. That's PovertyCureSummit.org today. Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In his article in the June 2020 issue of the Journal of Institutional Economics, Dr. P.J. Hill, who served as the George F. Bennett Professor of Economics at Wheaton College until his retirement in 2011, begins by saying, in any discussion of the beginning of modern economic growth, the concept of the rule of law plays a crucial role, and that the lack of such an order is the fundamental cause of the failure of nations. But where did the foundations of the rule of law come from? Hill argues that the current theories about the origin of the rule of law, while useful, are also incomplete. According to Hill, the Jewish and Christian concept of all human beings being created in God's image is an important but often overlooked contributor to the rule of law in Western civilization. Today, Acton's Dan Churchwell is joined by Dr. P.J. Hill to discuss his research article, The Religious Origins of the Rule of Law, The Way Beliefs Affect Institutions in General, and How the Beliefs of the Christian and Jewish Faith Traditions in Particular Were Crucial to the Establishment of the Rule of Law. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. P.J. Hill, Professor of Economic Emeritus at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, and currently the Senior Fellow at the Property and Environmental Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. We'll be talking with him on his, uh, about his recent paper, The Religious Origins of the Rule of Law, published recently in the Journal of Institutional Economics. P.J., welcome to Acton Line. Hey, it's good to be with you. We uh, obviously have a long-standing relationship. You've spoken for us in multiple uh, ways, and, and we really appreciate your connection to the Acton Institute. Um, and as you well know, upholding uh, the dignity of the human person is a core value uh, for what we talk and write a lot about here at the Institute, um, the rule of law, 
private property rights and how the, uh, those both contribute to a free society are kind of core uh, core values. And uh, this upholding of the dignity of the human person seemed to be a, a real central theme to your article, again, the, the religious origins of the rule of law. And, and you've written on many topics throughout your career. I, I think you were, uh, you were at Wheaton for almost 25 years, right? And, uh, and, and you wrote across, you know, multiple ideas within economics. But tell me a little bit why this topic uh, rose to the forefront of your current research. Certainly. Um, basically, my training is as an economic historian, and that's where I see myself academically. And as I, the last 10 years or so, there's been a big push in economics to try to understand the beginnings of modern economic growth. And we really date that right around 1800. We may fuss a little bit about the actual time. But until that period of time, most of the world was poor for most of the time. Uh, you, it would be periods, you know, in which, like in the Roman Empire, there would be some, some economic growth, but nothing sustained uh, in, Ital in Italian city-states and some other empires. So one of the great questions is, what happened to cause economic growth to take off, particularly in England and the Netherlands in 1800, and then it, you know, in the United States and the rest of Western Europe, and then in some other economies? So I've been reading that literature for a long time. Most of my research has been more specific uh, with respect to a you know, kind of a smaller question. I've written about property rights in the American West. I've written about some environmental issues. But it really fascinated me as I looked at that question. And I would say that there, there are some conclusions that come out of the literature. And there are a lot of very famous people that have written a, a great deal about that, economic historians trying to explain the takeoff. Because until 1800, there was no, we really did not have economic change that substantially benefited the ordinary person over long periods of time. And since 1800, we really have. So that's just the, the overwhelming question. And I thought there was a gap in those explanations. And so we'll talk more about, about the gap in those explanations. But the more I read, the more I became convinced that there was part of the understanding that I would like to try to explain more, and it's really, where do we get the rule of law? What's, what are the moral precepts behind the rule of law? And so it's that sort of an interest that the basically most of my work the last 10 years has been, has been focused on that particular issue. Well, fantastic. Let, I mean, let's just jump right in, I guess. You, you argue um, or, or engage the, the idea of the rule of law. And, and in, in the article, you, you say that the, these four things encompass the rule of law, that the government itself is bound by the law, that uh, every person in society is treated equally under the law, uh, human dignity of each individual is recognized and protected by the law, and then finally, that justice is accessible to all. Um, and and that, that's kind of what you mean by the rule of law. To, to expand on that, that theory again for us, why, why is that so important? It's important because um, for much of history, people were not equal under the law, and they weren't really equal in the minds of, of most people. Uh, people drew... Uh, borders between themselves, part of the time it was the family, part of the time it was your ethnic group, part of the time it was your tribal identity um, that focused on your identity was so heavily bound up in those particular groups. And my argument isn't that those sorts of identities aren't important, but that there is something we call equal human dignity before the law. And what that really means is we use the coercive power of government to enforce what, what uh, we think of as human rights. Uh, we could use the term natural law. Uh, some people make a distinction between natural law and natural rights. But the idea of just basic moral agency uh, and human dignity and that it needs to be we need to think of people that way, and we need to enforce it that way. And I don't think we realize how different the modern world is from the ancient world in terms of that concept. Yeah, it, it, as I was reading your article, it really is difficult, you know, to, to put yourself, um, unless you're, like you said, immersed in the literature or, or heavily historically um, educated that 
it's it's hard to put yourself in the place of somewhere where you didn't the freedoms that we take for granted, a lot of people take for granted, um, or the way in which we exist in our society today in the West, it it really did emerge from something. You, you kind of use the distinction natural state versus open access order. You mm-hmm. you use you make the distinction in your articles between these two ideas. Mm-hmm. Can, can you explain the, the natural state versus this open access order? That's a particular term that's used by Doug North, uh, John Wallace, and Barry Weingast. Doug North just passed away recently, uh, but it's a, uh, Violence and Social Orders is their book, a 2009 book. If anybody wants kind of a, a big view of uh, human history, uh, they could uh, go to that. Uh, it um, does give us uh, an overview. It's called Violence in Human History, and it's a a uh, great overview of that world. And they argue that throughout most of history, there were particular groups that governed society, dominant coalitions, and these coalitions were made up of um, whoever was in power. So they're different at different times. But the ordinary person uh, isn't, necess- isn't necessarily treated well under those sorts of systems. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's the slaves, sometimes it's a particular ethnic group, sometimes it's uh, based upon um, you know, other sorts of identities. But then they argue that around 1800, again, England and Netherlands moved to what's called an open access order, where freedom of contract is enforced, where people have general access to for different forms of business, and in particular, there is the rule of law, where people are treated equally under the law. They would say that's still not universal. It's quite a bit of the world doesn't live under that sort of an order. But uh, it has been very crucial for two reasons. One, it's the beginning of modern economic growth. And second, it really embodies a concept of justice uh, that most of us take for granted. I think it's been interesting to see just even in the last couple of decades in the U.S., you know, we've had a, we've had some major social movements, one, the uh, hashtag Me Too movement about women's rights and then the Black Lives Matter uh, recent movement. Um, we, we may want to argue about what particular form uh, we want to see the uh, rights enforced. And there's you know, lots of controversy there. But the interesting thing is there was no argument there about human equality. I mean, the argument is how well are we doing in putting it in place? But nobody was standing around saying, well, no, here's a group of people that don't qualify to be equal with other humans. And so it's just, it's now so deep in the fabric of our society, we forget that, say, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, um, longer than that, that that wasn't the case, that people were treated differently. And my argument is that it's, you know, it's a particular concept, the Judeo-Christian concept of people made in the image of God that gives the power and the impetus to move to a world of universal human dignity. And, and that, that title, um, The Religious Origins of the Rule of Law, T- tell us more. You, you, you talk about Jude- uh, Judaism and its introduction of this topic and then the expansion of Christianity on the topic. Mm-hmm. Um, give us just a little historical snippet of because that goes back a long time. It does. T- tell us about that. Okay, and there's some Jewish uh, scholars that uh, have done, I think, a very uh, nice job of laying out uh, the um, uh, that particular idea. Um, one of them is in, in the book is entitled "Created Equal: How the Bible Broke with Ancient Political Thought" by a scholar by the name of Berman, and he argues that Israel was very different than the other societies around it, in particular in that it recognized. Uh, human dignity. Uh, it said that there is moral agency on the part of of everyone, uh, and so uh, the the rulers of Israel were, were held accountable to the people and to God, and that was pretty different, a very different sort of a way of seeing the world, where most of the other Middle Eastern rulers claimed uh, that they were 
particularly special. And in in Israel, it was an egalitarian sort of a framework. And we forget how unusual that was, and that that the people individually were morally responsible for their behavior. Again, uh, you know, the biblical prophets uh, spend a fair amount of time talking about how how people are not doing what they ought to do. In order to make that argument, you have to say that people have moral agency. So Israel starts with that idea of, of universal moral agency. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it's, interest, it's in, uh, interesting that when the covenant is to be read, all the people are to come together to hear the covenant and agree with it. And so that's, a, again, a we look back and say, of course, that's the way a society uh, ought to work. But given the context of the times, that was not universally accepted. And then, of course, with Christianity, it builds even more firmly uh, on the concept of the Imago Dei, people made in the image of God, uh, that all people are equal. Uh, that it takes a long time to put into process, and I don't want to claim that um, Christians throughout time did a you know fantastic job of doing it. And, you know we we've, we've struggled with it in different ways uh, to try to put that into place. But when you think about Paul traveling around the Mediterranean, he was just making this fundamentally kind of radical argument: uh, neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. Um, you know, uh, there, we're all are, are different. We're all the same. Um, we're all the same because we're made in the image of God. We're all the same because we've sinned. And then from the Christian context, of course, uh, we all need the person of Jesus Christ to be redeemed. So both Jewish and, and Christian thought are fundamentally different from much of the other uh, ways of thinking about universal human dignity. And the important thing is that this played its way out in history so that when we get to Western Europe, um, in the 1600s to the 1800s, this is just a huge influence on how people are thinking. Well, right. It, it looks like, I mean, you move from St. Paul, you know, you, you referenced, you know, his, his letters in Galatians and Colossians, the, this idea, this egalitarian, radically egalitarian ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you went from essentially the first century to 1600. Mm -hmm. So you have like a millennium and a half. How, how did... I know it's a tangled web, but how did it develop? What what were some of the threads that allowed that to stay cur not current, but uh, embedded in the thought, so that it then uh, eventually developed into what we now know as the rule of law? Part of it was just articulation of responsibilities, and one of the responsibilities was for the poor, and that is again uh, the, the church was was a primary responsible responsible for making that particular argument uh, that we do have uh, responsibilities to other people because they're also image bearers and we ought to care for the poor. So orphanages, hospitals, these were things that were uh, kind of uniquely organized by the church. There were a few other places that did it, but not anywhere with the philosophical, theological grounding that the church did. Uh, there's other interesting cases. Uh, one of the most egalitarian uh, institutions was the monasteries, where you could join the monastery no matter what your social background. Now, you did have to accept the creedal statement of the monastery, but the idea of, the, of mixing people from a wide variety of social backgrounds, it didn't matter your family, your status, your income, uh, then you could become a member of a particular uh, monastic order for both men and women. That, again, was pretty radical. That was different than the way that most of society had been organized. So that just keeps working its way out, uh, and different religious figures actually uh, argue that the government officials should be held responsible for their behavior. So all of that, over time, um, you know, makes, uh, makes an impact on how we really think about the ordinary person and then Starting in the 1600s, we start getting a, even uh, broader arguments about it, and then finally it gets put into kind of the legal order. Now, now this might seem like a strange question. I, I, I don't know if it is, but it. So, what would be the practical? Let's let's say we're in um, 900 AD, and what would be the practical day-to-day -day impact? 
of having this natural order rather than a clear rule of law? What I mean, what what would what would be the effect? What would be the power relations, if you will, um, in a in a garden variety ordinary citi- a person's life? Well, if they were a, a worshiper at the church, they would hear again and again uh, of God's love for um, universal humanity, of God's concern for all people, uh, of His act of uh, forgiveness for all people. And so that would just be a part of your regular sort of a teaching. Now, again, at times, uh, Christianity didn't do a great job of putting that into practice. Uh, Christians held slaves. Christians made a uh, common cause at times with uh, uh, coercive orders that were not uh, recognizing human equality. But this underlying theme kept coming up. And so over time, people did keep hearing that, you know, that, that that was just a part of the way you were to think about the, about the world. And then, um, you know, when canon law started, started developed, uh, being developed more, uh, more clearly, say, after 1100, it becomes really an important part of canon law that, again, uh, universal human agency, uh, all people are made in the image of God, universal human dignity, uh, Again, not played out perfectly, Um, mistakes made. We look back and wonder why certain sorts of things were done. But just this theme keeps pushing. And then as particularly as Western Europe uh, develops, um, you know, a whole series of kind of competing political orders, then that makes it possible to kind of try it out in different sorts of ways. Well, yeah, and, and there's two questions I, I had for you. You know, the, it seems like there's two historically significant uh, pivot points uh, that feature prominently in your article, and obviously it's it's the Reformation and the Enlightenment. And so, again, as an economic historian, I know you there's a lot going on in, in this time frame, but you narrow down um, – to Western Europe, and, and you kind of separate it from from Latin Europe, mm-hmm. and primarily England and the Netherlands. Um, to tell us, uh, just give, can you weave the thread just a little bit about the Reformation and the Enlightenment, the importance of those two events, mm-hmm. and then and then why it manifested in in Western Europe. The Reformation changes the political changes the religious landscape quite a bit, but it changes the political landscape in significant ways in making kind of more for an open arguments about what, uh, who are humans and what they are. Now, I need to make it clear that the Reformation arguments were not over the human dignity argument. So when we look at, say, Refor- Reformation figures, say, uh, Johann Althusius, or go back a little bit earlier to John Calvin uh, or Theodore Beza, uh, they're really accepting the traditional church's arguments about human dignity. So the Reformation is not important in terms of introducing the idea of human dignity. It's been there all the way along. The church has been arguing for it. Uh, you know, it's, it's been an important part of, uh, of the theology that people are, are, are living with. What the Reformation does is it changes the whole tenor of discussion, and because of the political order, that there's all of these competing kind of small kingdoms, then you start seeing, you know, uh, one, uh, one kingdom going becoming uh, more a part of the Reformation movement, uh, the Protestant movement, most others remaining their ca- retaining more of their Catholic identity. What this means is that there's more of an open argument and um, opportunities to practice on the both um, on the part of both Catholics and Protestants uh, this idea of of human dignity. So the the, the Reformation changes that uh, political landscape enough that the arguments are a little bit more out in the open. And there's uh, and you do you do get the religious wars, uh, you know, in which Catholics and Protestants are quite willing to fight with each other, which would seem to violate some of the principles of universal dignity. So that all has to be worked out. And so that's just that process of working it out is what's important, say, from, from the Reformation uh, up to 1800. We do get the Enlightenment figures, uh, you know, Mon- uh, Montesquieu, uh, Hobbes, Locke, uh, you know, Voltaire, a whole bunch of others. And the, 
one of the points that where my article differs from some of the readings of, say, intellectual history, um, people, some people would say that the rule of law kind of originates in, the, in these enlightenment sorts of figures, that they're the ones who think up the rule of law. I think that's a misreading of history. It was there for a long time before. It was articulated by the church. It was articulated by other um, religious uh, groups that, that took it seriously. What the Enlightenment did was to think about, okay, what sort of a political order can we uh, use to put this into place? And so what the Enlightenment figures uh, argued was that we need a way of organizing our politics or our government. And it's at that point then that the whole idea of human, universal human dignity uh, starts to get instantiated into the legal political order. And that's really crucial. Uh, previously, it wasn't as much a part of the legal order. Uh, canon law had done some of that, uh, but canon law wasn't, um, you know, wasn't a, university, a universal legal order. So it, um, the other interesting thing is that even Enlightenment scholars who would claim to be, say, kind of anti-religious like Thomas Hobbes, had by that point, by the point of their writing, uh, had accepted um, the whole idea of universal dignity. So it would become a part of their thinking. So you'll read Hobbes, you read Locke, you read Montesquieu, and they all accept universal human dignity. What they're really arguing about is what should the political order look like in order to put this in place? Yeah, and, and that, that seems like the the huge question or elephant in the room. I mean, uh, several years ago, I got to take the family to Washington, D.C., and uh, we, we were able to look at the Declaration of Independence, you know, the original documents. Uh, in the museum we were in, they actually had a, an extant copy of the Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's these foundational documents historically, um, you know, post-1100 that, that seem to engage this topic, but th but then there's there's long spans of time. Why do you think it's you know you have the Reformation and then you know, the Enlightenment engagement, but then you said 1800 seems to be a pivot point as well um, for this argument. What it seems like they're compressing. You know the idea of the rule of law it, it gets compressed and, and you have more traction um, in real political states or for you know for the bulk of people. Why is that? Why do you think that compression is happening? Or it happened. Well, great question, and a and an ongoing issue among people writing about that. Uh, Barry Weingast, a Stanford uh, e political scientist economist, uh, has asked the question several times: Why 1800? And he's provided some answers. I don't think they're complete. Uh, there's a couple of other books that are in process uh, trying to answer uh, that sort uh, of a question. Uh, so. I'll give you an answer, but it may not be a uh, complete one. Uh, a lot of different forces are are coming together. Uh, one, of course, is uh, Gutenberg's printing press uh, in, you know, in the late 1400s, and uh, that means that the arguments that that become uh, more a part of ongoing debate. Uh, just they're just there more because they're, they're so much easier uh, to put out or, or to, to make them known. So the printing press is one of the things that happens. The particular political order, um, kind of, you know, the uh, Roman Empire is made up of these kind of competing um, political states. That allows for lots of uh, back and forth between different sorts of, uh, of political orders. So that's important. Um, I can't give you a great answer in terms of why we start getting all of these really interesting figures writing about it, you know, you, um, that are the Enlightenment writers. Why, why, why does that happen? And I'm not a great enough intellectual historian to give you, give you, you know, uh, great foundational reasons, but we do know that this whole issue of uh, what is what should government be? Who are the people that are a part of that government? Those were all just um, huge sorts of questions. And it's interesting, in the 1600s in England, there's over 20,000 different pamphlets that are printed. Hmm. And a lot of these are about arguing about the rights of humanity. And then the question, 
how do you put it in place? And of course, during that period of time, you have the British Civil War uh, in 1688. Um, you know, you, you you put into place as kind of a uh, uh, well, a statement about uh, English rights. Uh, And so 1688, 1689 are important in terms of more of an articulation uh, of the particular rights there. Um, The founding of the United States, uh, and as as you talk about, the Declaration of Independence is an articulation of those sorts of ideas. So there's just a huge amount going on during that period of time. And it all seems to come together. And I, uh, I think we're going to have to spend a little more time trying to figure it all out. Uh, how did it all come together? Uh, I'm trying to uh, get more recognition of the idea of human equality, and that is starting to play a bigger role uh, during that period of time. Yeah, and, and in your article you mentioned, or, or I was getting the sense too, that as – these conceptions were more either codified or written into law or, or followed by the people that wrote about it that concurrently with the rule of law and this engagement that you actually had economic prosperity growing along with the rule of law. Is, was that an, is that an accurate historical argument? Well, in, in a sense it is. Uh, however, the rule of law is really important for the beginning of economic takeoffs. Uh, in you know in uh, in Western Europe, particularly England and the Netherlands to start with, but it, but also then across the, the rest of of uh, Western Europe. So it's you are getting some more economic growth. There becomes kind of this international community of people working on technology, and the property rights are becoming clear enough that it, in a sense you have. You have the right to your ideas, and you also have the right to make money off of putting into place uh, new ideas. And so that becomes important. So it all it all kind of happens together. I would say the rule of law actually drives economic prosperity more than economic – I mean, I, I think that's the driving force. You have to put that in, and you have to recognize uh, the equality of all people – in order to get the beginnings of economic takeoff. Now, there is a feedback mechanism because once that happens, then uh, people start thinking about, well, maybe this is a way that both my dignity would be recognized and my economic well-being could be uh, improved if we have rule of law, which then leads to innovation, to entrepreneurship, uh, basic questions of uh, instantiation of justice. Yeah, that's good. And it, it seemed like in, in the Journal of uh, Institutional Economics that there was a – there is an ongoing conversation about this. T- is, that, is that right? Right. There is. Yeah, I'm pleased to get my article there because there are some people who will probably disagree with it. Um, I've already had conversations with Deirdre McCloskey, a very well-known economic historian, and she thinks the period from the Protestant Reformation – uh, up to, say, 1789, um, say, the, the French Revolution. That, that, and she says ideas really changed during that period, the ideas about the ordinary person and the worth of the ordinary person. So I appreciate her work. She doesn't want to go back nearly as far as I do, so we disagree about some of those sorts of things. That's one of the many places that uh, she publishes. So it'll be interesting to see over the next uh, several years as people interact with this idea. I should say that I'm not the first to make this argument. Um, Quite a few intellectual historians have been been, uh, arguing this point. What's different, I think, is that I'm connecting the arguments of of the intellectual historians uh, with uh, the whole idea of what the economic historians are talking about. And if I have anything to contribute, it's trying to make uh, that sort uh, of a connection, because I don't think that that's been made as clearly uh, uh, as in the past. It's interesting, there's been work that's come out since I published this. Actually, the, you know, the article came out in June, but that means, of course, that I'd been writing on it for a long time b- before, and it was actually accepted um, about eight or nine months ago. After it was accepted, there's a new book by Tom Holland, 
uh, a British historian called Dominion. Oh, sure. Right. And he's making the same argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, the world is different. Yeah. <laughs> and why is it different? And he gears most or focuses mostly on Christianity and how Christianity has changed the world. So his is, is he's not making the argument in terms of e- the economies where mine is, but uh, I would say his argument fits with changes in the world that we don't always recognize, that the idea of universal human equality is a fairly recent concept in a, in a, histori- in a historical uh, time frame. Only in the last two or three hundred years is it kind of more, mostly generally accepted. And so there's almost, I mean, there is slavery in the world, and that's the tragedy but there's almost no intellectual grounds now I mean, for slavery. And so you, you don't have these huge debates about should people be able to enslave people, other people or not. We just it's accepted that that's a moral wrong. Again, you look back in history, and that's very unusual because people did enslave other people, and there didn't need to even be a strong moral argument for it because it was so generally accepted. So... The end of slavery, uh, the beginning of, of uh, complete rights for women, uh, uh, universal equality for people of all races, uh, all of those sorts of things, we think, uh, well, that's kind of the way it should be. And from my personal perspective, I would say, yes, that's the way it should be. But that's not the way the world was organized several thousand years ago. The fact that we take those things as kind of givens now is just really very important uh, that we understand the the roots of of the human equality argument. That's good. You, I mean, you, from your article, uh, from Tom Holland's recent book, I've read a few interviews um, with with that topic in mind as well. And then you have Rodney Stark as a sociologist making somewhat you know similar articles in his sphere mm-hmm. as well. It, it seems like um, one of the major benefits of of this kind of line of reasoning is that, and I, and I think you promote this too, is that you're trying to get back to the, that the idea of institutions and how and don't you differentiate from Deirdre uh, McCloskey's on the idea of institutional engagement with this topic? Right. Yeah, and that's one of the places where she and I would have some disagreement. She she think it's, it's mostly in the idea realm. I think the ideas, the concept are really important. But I, f- I do find the change in the institutional setting, what we call the rules of the game, and equality under those rules. Now, again, you know, to, even though we're, we're ta- I'm arguing that in the 1600s, these were really important arguments, uh, remember that the U.S. was a slaveholding society in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't happen perfectly. It doesn't happen immediately. Um, but it is the case now that um, anti-slavery arguments gain a lot of traction. <laughs> Human equality arguments have a lot of traction because we generally accept those as a part of who we are. I don't think I sometimes think that people don't don't realize where that comes from, and I just think the whole concept of um, all people made in the image of God has been much more influential than what many modern people think about. They just think that's always been that way, and we've always thought that way. What? Yeah, and and what what do you think? This this will probably be. Um, our last question, but I want to bring us, yeah, to the modern era as we're discussing this. What do you think the the takeaway for us, if if you were to give us some parting thoughts on the if you if that connective tissue disappears, if that um, remembered past or that that idea of uh, that there was a religious origin to this idea that has brought freedom and opportunity, even though it has taken time and, like you said, um, clearly has not been perfect, mm-hmm. but it, it has been shown to bring the most amount of prosperity, both human flourishing, both for individuals and families and societies. If that is forgotten – what what do you think we will miss? What what is if the the arguments that are trying to talk about equality, um, if, if they miss the religious origins of that, what what do you think is the the problem with that idea? Well, I think that it's much harder to maintain that over time without 
uh, a religious, philosophical, theological base. And that's why, you know, I've been uh, appreciative of the Acton Institute, because one of the things that the Acton Institute does a great job of is taking us back to think about, well, how do these ideas of human equality uh, work themselves out historically? And why is it important that we think about the possibility to, of transcendence, that there are universal human principles that are there because of uh, of transcendence and because there is a God of the universe. And I think that it's going to be harder to maintain the, those sorts of concepts in a completely relativistic world. Um, if you really start pushing uh, hard uh, against uh, on the concept of complete materialism and complete uh, relativistic thinking, then it becomes harder to maintain these ideas. And so I think going back and trying to figure out where they came from is important just for our history, but it's also important for us to think about the human being and the human being as um, as something more than material well material beings. We uh, we have a transcendent sense in us because we know there's a transcendent God. And I just I think we have to continue to come back to that uh, as the Acton Institute does to understand these ideas, uh, to give a sound grounding of them, and then wanting to see them worked out in the day-to-day -day political, economic, institutional life. Well, PJ, uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us to talk about this article. I wish you all the best in your current research and can't wait to uh, kind of get up to speed and, and to see where some of this uh, goes in the conversation because that religious tenor or that connective tissue really is important. Like you said, uh, the anthropology piece of who we are as human persons made in the image of God um, and what that leads to for human flourishing is, is very important and very practical. So thank you for participating today. Thank you for the opportunity. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at acton.org. Until next week, for Act in Line, I'm Eric Cohn.